All right, so we're going to talk about probability. Now we're going to get into the meat of this. We're going to actually calculate the probability of certain things happening. Um, we did a little bit last time, so let's do a couple quick reviews. The general addition rule, uh, you have two events, A and B, that are disjoint. Um, we can use the addition rule for disjoint events. This is what we covered last um, chapter. And basically, the probability of U or B occurring is the probability of A occurring plus the probability of B occurring. However, when our events are not disjoint, the earlier addition rule will double count uh, the probability for both A and B occurring. Thus, we need the general addition rule. So let's look at this. Um, the general addition rule for any two events, A and B, uh, the probability of A or B occurring is actually equal to, now disjoint, if you don't remember, disjoint, the Venn diagram would look, um, there'd be two circles that don't overlap. So this is the scenario where they are not disjoint. There's overlap between event A and event B. Uh, number of boys, uh, 15 or older, right? So you're gonna have boys, you're gonna have girls, but you're gonna have boys that are 15, you're gonna have boys that are not 15. Uh, so there's gonna be an overlap between the two events. Well, we wouldn't include the girls if we were just doing boys, okay? So anyways, because of this overlap, we don't wanna count this twice. So you have the probability of A, which is in green, plus the probability of B, which is in pink. But then you want to subtract the intersection, A and B, because you don't want to count that twice because you've already counted it once here and you've already counted it once here. So the Venn diagram kind of shows you why we're doing that. We just don't want to count the overlap, okay? And this is not disjoint. Remember, disjoint, you have two separate circles. So back in chapter three, we looked at contingency tables and talked about conditional distributions. Um, when we want the probability of an event of a conditional distribution, we would write this notation here, and this is the probability of B given A. That's what that looks like, okay? So whenever you see this symbolism, uh, that's saying the probability of B given that A has occurred. So the probability it takes into account a given condition is called a conditional probability. Uh, we've done a couple of those already. So to find the probability of B given the event A, we restrict our attention to the outcomes in A, uh, and then we find the fraction of those outcomes of B that also occur. So the formula then is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. So these are just straight up formulas. You're just gonna calculate these things, plug them into the equation, and go from there. What'll happen though is that in some of these situations, we're gonna have to combine some of these formulas. Note that the probability of A cannot equal zero. All right, so since we know that A has occurred, right? So we're saying that the probability of B the probability of B given that A occurs. Well, if A never occurs, then the probability of B doesn't matter. That's what they're trying to say with that. So then, when two events, A and B, are independent, we can use the multiplication rule for independent events from chapter 14. Um, so the probability of A and B, remember, is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So we're gonna use lots of formulas. Uh, what I suggest is you make a note card or just write all the formulas down when you go to do your homework on a separate sheet of paper so you could see them all and you're just gonna crank through them, all right? However, when our events are not independent, uh, the earlier multiplication rule does not apply. So this is another thing that you have to think about. They're gonna give you the clues and the problem. So when they are not independent, we encounter the general multiplication rule in the form of conditional probability. Regarding the equation and the definition of conditional probability, we get that the general multiplication rule of uh, the probability of A and B could be the probability of A times the probability of B given A or the probability of B times the probability of A given B. So that's if they're not independent. Independence for two events means that the outcome from one event does not influence the probability of the other. 
um, if they, with our new notation for conditional probabilities, we can now formalize uh, a definition. The events A and B are independent whenever the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. Okay. Equivocally, the same thing occurs between A and B. The probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A because one doesn't have an influence on the other, right? So that's something to, to think about. The clues will be given to you. Disjoint events cannot be independent. Well, why not? Since we know that disjoint events have no outcomes in common, knowing that one, one occurred means the other didn't. Um, thus, the probability of the second occurring changed based on our knowledge of the first occurred. It follows then that two events are not independent. A common error is to treat disjoint events as if they were independent and apply the multiplication rule for independent events. Don't make that mistake. They're telling you don't do this. Okay, You're, you, you probably will anyway. So that's why we'll probably have to go over a lot of questions um, in uh, over the homework. Depending on independence. So it's much easier to think about independent events than to deal with conditional probabilities. It seems that most people uh, have a natural intuition for probabilities breaks down when it becomes a, a conditional probability. Don't fall into this trap. Whenever you see probabilities multiplied together, stop and ask whether you think they are really independent. So when we're going to be given all these scenarios in your homework, really think about is this disjoint, is it independence, because that helps you choose the correct formula. Okay? Sampling without replacement means once one individual is drawn, it doesn't go back into the pool. We often sample without replacement, which doesn't matter too much when we're dealing with a large population. However, when drawing with a small population, we need to take note and adjust probabilities accordingly. Uh, cards. A lot of times when we draw a card out of the deck, we're drawing it without replacement. I'm dealing you cards. Okay, That's one scenario. I'm not putting the card back in pulling things out of a bag, marbles out of a bag. You, these are the things you have to think about. Drawing without replacement um, is just another instance of working with conditional probabilities. A tree diagram helps us to think about conditional probabilities by showing the sequence of events as the paths that look like branches of a tree. Now, this, a tree diagram is great to wrap your head around, but uh, I can't draw a tree diagram for 52 cards in the deck. Uh, that's a lot. But it does help for like flipping coins and small things. Um, making a tree diagram for situations of conditional probabilities is consistent with our make a picture. All right, so if I say you're going to roll two die, what could I roll on the first one? Well, I could roll a one, I could roll a two, I could roll a three. I could draw a tree diagram for that. It'll tell me all the outcomes. It'll, I can calculate probabilities. Um, that's a little hard to do with a deck of cards. So here's what one looks like. All right. So this figure is a nice example of a tree diagram that shows we multiply the probabilities of the branches together. The final outcomes are disjoint and must add up to one. Um, we can add the final probabilities to find the probabilities of compound events. So um, I'm not quite sure what this is relating to, um, but it says the three choices. So there's two things. You can binge watch, or I don't know if it's binge, binge watch. I don't know what binge means, but you can binge. You can you do something moderately, and you can abstain from doing it. So there's a probability attached to these. And then the second condition, or the conditional part, is if you binge watch and it's an accident. It, I'm not, I don't know why I'm saying binge watch. If you binge something by accident, or if you binge uh, something and none. So basically, I have three choices in the first scenario and two choices in the second. What's three times two? Six. How many outcomes do we have? six. What do the outcomes add up to? Six. No, they add up to one. If you, if you take these decimals and add them all up, they equal one. Okay. Now, 
But if you notice, 0.44 times 0.17, I mean, the, the formula that they use when they, when they do this, that's how you get this probability. So by doing a simple tree diagram, another example of this, which, which would be easier, is like an outfit. I have uh, three pairs of jeans and two shirts. How many possible combinations can I have? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So reserving the conditioning, rever or not reserving, reversing the conditioning. Well, reversing conditioning for two events is rarely intuitive. Uh, suppose we want to know the probability of A given B, and we know only the probability of A, the probability of B, and the probability of B given A. Well, basically what we're doing is we're using the formulas that we know to reverse engineer to find the probabilities that we need. So the question is, we want to know the probability of A given B. Well, then I need to know the probability of A and B over the probability of B. But I don't know this probability, the probability of A and B. I can calculate it, but I also know that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. So I kind of reverse it, okay? Uh, it is, but it's not. It's just like, it's really a system of equations when you think about it. You, you have, uh, basically you have a number of unknowns, and then you got to go through and solve the unknowns by using a couple of formulas. So you have two unknowns in the scenario, you need two formulas, you plug one into the other, and then you get what you need. Um, Well, it's a conditional, so we th those assumptions have already been made for us. This is just one example, though, of how you, like, so there's going to be a homework problem where you're going to go, well, wait, I don't have everything that I need to plug this into the formula, so you're going to have to kind of reverse engineer to get the probability that you need. So you'll, you'll have a conditional statement, and it'll say the probability of B given A, and then if you look at the formula to do that, you're going to be missing one thing. So you got to work backwards to get the one thing that you need. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And this is just one example of it. So um, what can go wrong? Well, <laughs> lots, I guess. But don't use a simple probability rule where the general rule is appropriate. Don't assume that the two events are independent or disjoint without checking that they are. Okay. Uh, uh, the scenario of pants and shirts. I have three pairs of pants and two shirts. Well, does it matter what type of pants I choose? Will that have an influence on the type of shirt that I choose? Could it? I mean, it could, but does it really if I'm totally random? No. Right? So those are the things we got to think about. It depends on how the question is framed. If it says matching outfit, and I have three pairs of pants, one blue, one black, one tan, and a blue shirt and green shirt, um, that you, you could argue one way or the other. But if it says it's completely random and I just choose, we always have to assume randomness. Uh, but that, uh, that's a great example. It changes the formulas we use. Um, don't find probabilities for samples drawn without replacement if they have been drawn with replacement. So if I say, what's the probability of getting four of a kind? Doubt to me. Well, when they deal the cards to me, they're not replacing the cards. Uh, we'll do some examples of that, and you'll be, you'll be surprised at what a difference the probability, how much it changes with replacement and without. Um, don't reverse conditioning uh, naively. Um, you're not going to do it in every problem, but you might be forced to. And don't confuse disjoint with independent. Okay. Um, the probability rules for chapter 13, only work in special cases when events are disjoint or independent. Your homework in, in uh, chapter 14, you're going to have some uh, different scenarios. Okay, We know the general addition rule and the general uh, multiplication rule. We also know that conditional probabilities and reversing the conditioning can uh, give surprising results. Venn diagrams, tables, and tree diagrams help organize our thinking about probabilities. We now know more about independence and sound understanding of independence will be important throughout the rest of the course. Okay. 
So here are some AP tips for the AP exam. Read conditional probabilities carefully. Uh, most AP problems use data for probability problems. Become skilled at finding probabilities in two-way tables. Um, we're going to do a lot of two-way tables, contingency tables, conditional probabilities uh, for the rest of the school year. Checking independence on a two-way table is a critical skill. Uh, the reason it's critical is that it's a timed thing. They can give you a two-way table. You can figure out quickly probabilities based on this two-way table as opposed to actually doing a bunch of stuff. Okay, And uh, that's it.